can shoot a gun and ride a horse and kill without thought, you're in. Think how long some of you have been with me. I imagine Colm doesn't even know half the names of these fools. Oh shit! Look out! More of the bastards coming out of the tree! O'Driscoll's began pouring out of the forest at an immediately alarming rate. Some charged in on horses, some charged in on foot, but all of them were armed and ready to take our heads off like a child inside of a Lego store. Dutch and Bill held their covered positions while Micah continued on his vicious rampage, clearly still having bitch slap flashbacks as he tore into any O'Driscoll stupid enough to take him on. I was unsure if sitting back would still result in the enemies killing one of the boys, so I tagged along with Micah once again, following closely with my last so, so I could immobilize any of his opponents as we went. We're given the option to either hold our defensive position or meet the enemies head on by advancing into the trees. And even though I was still feeling very confident since we had Mike the Unstoppable Super Soldier with BSPTSD on our side, the defensive strategy definitely seemed to be the right play here. Unfortunately, Micah in this state was unable to comprehend the concept of maintaining a defensive position and legged it into battle instead. I checked the map and knew straight away that he was going to need some help, which turned out to be a severe understatement because Micah was pretty much surrounded by the entire population of Puerto Rico by the time I got there, so I'd say he might have approached this situation with a little bit of overconfidence. Which is completely fine because, let's not forget, Micah had only just carried us through the most excruciating challenge the boys had faced yet, so it goes without saying that he deserved to be the one sitting back for once. I gave this segment of the mission a couple more tries with varying levels of success, but it was obvious to me that Micah was exhausted. Getting someone to trigger him a second time so soon after his last episode just wasn't going to work when he required at least a day or two to rejuvenate. He'd already done so much for us, so it only seemed right that we went ahead and returned the favor. So as the enemies charged out of the forest for the fourth time, I began playing a little more defensively with my lasso. I skirted the edges of our position, being careful to only move up to the first line of enemies, and I went back to give Micah some moral support before disarming one of the persistent O'Driscolls and leading him into a direct line of fire. His death marked the end of the first wave, but there were many more left to take on. Dutch gave us the defend or attack option once again, and as much as I'd love to say that I had some sort of fail-proof plan that involved playing aggressively this time, uh, I just hit the wrong button, so off into the trees we went. I tripped enemy after enemy while the boys played Rambo in the bushes, and I just have to say, after the events of last episode that left me wanting to tie cinder blocks to my ankles and jump in the Pacific Ocean, it was beyond relieving to have things go this well. It actually felt like Rockstar was giving me the freedom to complete the mission the way that I wanted to. I mean, sure, it was an unnecessarily difficult way to complete the mission, but I chose to do it that way, and I wasn't forced into failure the way I'd expected. So I dragged the final enemy up the street, and it was put to rest by Bill, finally marking the end of this segment, which I actually managed to get through with zero knockouts and zero kills. Arthur's saint status was only growing stronger, and soon he would gain the ability to walk on water. <laughs> With the enemies dealt with, our plan to steal the O'Driscoll's equipment could finally go forward. The boys began searching for anything useful to the V-Bucks robbery, Arthur discovered some dynamite while Bill discovered a new fetish, and with all of the equipment finally acquired, we began the trek back to the camp, feeling more triumphant than ever. But all of this was merely preparation for a much more dangerous and intricate operation. A train heist that would usually require weeks of careful planning was to be carried out in a couple of days' time. And soon, Arthur would have no choice but to make the most difficult decision of his life. A couple of days pass and the morning of the robbery finally arrives. Arthur visits John before they leave as John is unable to attend due to his injuries, and he expresses his disdain towards Dutch for discriminating against him because of his scars. I'm the Joker, baby! As everybody prepares to leave for the heist, there was one question on Arthur's lips that had gone unanswered all this time. Who is Leviticus Cornwall? Hosea began to explain the man they were about to rob the man they were about to make a great enemy out of. Leviticus Cornwall was the most powerful businessman on the planet, the controller of all V-Bucks, the CEO of Epic Games. <laughs> this series is something else. Arthur, Frank, Dutch, Bill, Micah, Charles, Lenny, 
all prepared to put their lives on the line for the promise of untold riches in the form of the world's most valuable currency. They arrive at the meet point. Bill begins setting up the explosives and Arthur rushes down to assist him. As Arthur returns to the top of the hill, Dutch begins relaying the plan to make sure that everybody is up to speed. The train transporting the V-Bucks will be approaching from the north, and the goal is to blow the tracks and board the train once it crosses the border, where the boys will be waiting at a safe vantage point. Charles will scout the outside of the train to ensure nobody interferes from another position, Dutch will take care of the driver and the engineer, Lenny and Javier will attack the two front carriages and deal with any guards that might be present leaving Arthur, Frank, and Micah to deal with the final carriage, which will contain the V-Bucks that they're after. All angles were covered. The plan sounded simple, straight to the point, and very effective. And perhaps the absolute greatest part of this master plan was that it didn't even get past the first step. And I'd thought about this mission quite a lot as I have done with some others, in terms of whether or not there may be a forced kill. A kill that we simply cannot avoid if we want to progress. And as far as I could remember, there wasn't. So going into this mission, the main priority once again was to progress with as few knockouts as possible. And it seems straight away that this mission actually gave us a little more freedom than what we had encountered so far. As usual, my first attempts could be compared to Homer Simpson attempting to assemble a barbecue in that one episode. Just a whole lot of useless and a splash of brain dead, but if there's one thing that these very early attempts taught me, is that Lenny can absolutely not hold his own. It was immediately obvious that the primary issue of this mission would be getting Lenny to survive long enough for us to complete it. And I just want to make one thing clear, that is not Lenny's fault. We all love Lenny. He's a sweet, innocent cowboy who's just out to prove himself. He's one of the nicest people in the entire game. But god I would be lying if I said I didn't want to wrap a fence paling around his head by the time this mission was over. I mean, sure, Micah needed a little help when he was busy assassinating every O'Driscoll in a 500 meter radius, but Lenny? Being a beginner in the outlaw game and all, he was just a little more fragile. However, on the bright side, I did discover early on that this mission actually allowed us to tie up any of the enemies we wanted to, which was unbelievably helpful considering Lenny would drop dead if an enemy blinked at him too aggressively. After a few more attempts, I also discovered that if you just follow Lenny into one of the carriages, you can send him to take out one of the first enemies silently, which causes him to move up and engage the next wave without any prior damage. The next step was getting him to move up with you into the second phase of the mission, which involves approaching an enemy that climbs up to the top of the carriage with you, making it very difficult to restrain him without him falling off the train to his death. I found a solution to this a couple of attempts later, where I just ran ahead and left Lenny to deal with the other enemies. It seems as though he just teleports to you once you reach a certain point, which allows him to skip the fight in the other carriages completely. Dealing with the enthusiastic guard who wants to just have the typical fight scene on top of the train had one simple solution. Before he climbs up properly, I would just barge him onto the ground where he would land safely. What wasn't so simple was solving why exactly Lenny would just die out of nowhere whenever we would reach this point. After a while, I chalked it up to maybe being because Lenny was being shot from behind by the enemies he skipped, but I really wasn't sure. So I spent a long time trying to escort Lenny through the enemies, giving him all the encouragement he could have possibly needed. You can do it, mate. I believe in you. Woo! And if you gave Lenny enough assistance, I mean, he did have the capabilities to really make some progress. Once I figured out how to get up to this point with Lenny consistently, I realized that waiting to tie up the guard I barge onto the ground would result in the other guard one-shotting Lenny before I had the chance to restrain him too. Now this seemed like a pretty easily fixable issue. I just go and tie the other guard up as soon as I barge the first one off the carriage. Problem solved. Done. Finished. On to the next phase. But one thing you need to remember about this series is, it really isn't ever that simple. In fact, with Lenny and his inexperience, it was about a hundred more times difficult than that, because I actually had to get Lenny there every single time. A full, high effort escort mission, every single time the actual mission failed. Now this was a long and grueling process, and although Lenny was a massive obstacle here, I still love you Lenny. I also had to make sure that I didn't die, with no food, no health tonics, and my refusal to commit murder. So it was a while before I could even try the strategies that I had in mind, because I was stuck getting Lenny trying to survive more than three and a half seconds. Now I know I'm just repeating myself at this point, Isaiah, we get it, it took a long time, there were a lot of attempts, in a playthrough like this that kinda goes without saying, and I completely agree, wholeheartedly. But uh, I'm gonna say it again. 
Because me being fed up with just how many times I tried to get Lenny to survive actually caused me to get further. Sort of. I was so done with holding Lenny's hand through the shootouts that I just ran ahead again. I jumped on top of the carriages, sprinted past the guy I usually barge, restrained the second guard, and watched as Lenny actually didn't get shot to pieces for once. Kinda seemed like I'd actually made it, so I went straight for the train controls. Now don't worry, I'm not completely brain dead. I did in fact remember the train conductor with the shovel. He proceeded to take my two front teeth out with it, and I was ready to break from his grapple and let Lenny do the shooting. But what I didn't remember is that breaking from his grapple actually meant throwing him off the edge of the train. And so, in this moment, my only choice was to see what would happen if I didn't break from his grasp. No variation of waiting him out worked. If you didn't break free, you were getting thrown off that train, no questions asked. And although originally it had seemed like a blessing that we were now at a checkpoint, this meant that we were now stuck either murdering the train conductor or being murdered ourselves. This was a decision that I really didn't think we would have to make so early in the game. And because you're required to walk past that train conductor to progress the mission, I was now convinced at this point that we weren't getting Arthur through this mission without a kill under his belt. But there was no way that I was about to let that happen without trying absolutely every possible solution first. Every. Possible. Solution. So because of that checkpoint, I was required to restart the mission entirely. I got back up to where I was before, and set out to try absolutely everything. I did not want to believe that Arthur would be forced into murder here, so... Here was my thinking. We had to get to the train controls to stop this train. That was currently the primary objective. But to do that, we actually had to get to the front of the train, where the train conductor is waiting patiently to turn our brains into flesh salsa. So, what if the solution was to somehow bypass the conductor so that the animation couldn't trigger? If we could somehow get in front of the conductor without walking through and triggering the animation, we could, in theory, get behind him, catch him with the lasso, and let Lenny do any of the shooting instead. The main problem with this plan was finding a way to actually get in front of the conductor. It would be impossible to jump off the train and somehow get in front of it again on foot. So my solution was to call upon the greatest companion Arthur could have ever asked for. If I could somehow get Frank to follow the train and ride alongside it, I could jump onto him from one of the carriages, ride ahead to the front of the train, and get on at the front stairs completely bypassing the conductor and his murder or death animation. Now I already knew getting this to work was going to be a massive stretch, but I had to at least try. So I began whistling for Frank as soon as I saved Lenny from falling. I had no clue if Frank would even respond from this distance, but after checking the map to see if he'd changed his position, it was reaffirmed even stronger to me that Frank was the most loyal companion in the West. He did go out of range for a while, but as I progressed through the train, I noticed he was following again. I checked the map and there he was, less than the train's length away from us. I began moving back down the train and saw him. Frank, our holy savior, galloping to the rescue once again. I continued trying to get closer, but the land kept getting divided by bridges. And this caused Frank to reroute as he would avoid going over the bridges at all costs until it was absolutely the final option. Eventually, Frank did get over his fear of structures that connect pieces of land together and came racing to the rescue once more. It seemed as though he couldn't completely catch up with the train, so I decided I'd try to carefully step off the back carriage and mount him before the train got too far away. Given that I'd had a few experiences so far with falling off the train, it came as no surprise that the mission ended almost instantly. I tried to get Frank to follow us a few more times after that, but my problem now was him suddenly being too far out of range. My guess was that calling him and getting him to follow in the first place was only possible if I was to restart the mission and whistle for him before the main checkpoint after jumping onto the train. The only semi-good news I got out of the next 25 or so attempts was that I could now confirm that Lenny would be killed by the enemies in the first few carriages if we simply tried to run past them. they just end up following and shooting Lenny from behind, so at least at this point I knew the reason for his random, unexplainable deaths. However, this didn't stop Lenny from somehow finding a way to get himself killed in every other situation before that point. Frank not being able to follow the train all of a sudden definitely killed me inside, don't get me wrong, but 
Nothing made me want to take my toes off with a hedge trimmer more than Lenny's inability to survive. I was desperate to test more solutions for bypassing the forced train conductor kill, but simply getting back to that point without Lenny dying was a mission all on its own. So when I finally did, I immediately felt fragments of my sanity flooding back. I felt like a new man after getting back to this point after so long, and I was beyond ready to try something new with the train conductor. I wanted to see if I could maybe jump onto the metal box he was hiding behind, and even though I was pretty sure it wouldn't work, I figured it was still worth it since it was such a low risk thing to try. But if there's one thing that I've learned so far while making this series, it's that things almost never go according to plan. I'd like to think I've been, you know, pretty patient while making this series so far, you know? There have been some pretty frustrating challenges already, but I'd like to think I've gotten through most of it quite calmly, you know, been pretty chill about whatever problems have arisen, but something about seeing the train conductor's shovel draw me to it like Arthur's nose was made out of fucking iron had me in such disbelief that <laughs> all I could do was pause the game and stare at the screen. Now terrified of the train conductor and his phantom shovel, I decided to go back to hunting for new ways to avoid the seemingly unavoidable murder. After a couple more Lenny deaths, I got to the final carriages, still clueless as to what I could do next. I tied the final guard while Lenny shot the other and began calling for Frank just in case it somehow worked. Of course, Frank couldn't hear my desperate cries for help from across the map, but there was literally no other solution in my mind. Avoiding the train conductor's inescapable animation seemed nothing short of impossible at this point, and Lenny wouldn't even shoot the final, restrained enemy just to top it all off. I was stuck to the tracks. I had nowhere to run, nothing to do, no mica to trigger, and this kind of helplessness, it does things to people. And so I needed a moment to reflect. If I really was going to have to let our good boy Arthur throw this innocent, shovel-wielding train conductor off a train to his death, I would at least take some time to reflect before destroying Arthur's reputation as the goodest boy in the West. Having almost completed my journey around the entire map, the train was just about pulling into where the heist had begun. I decided since we were now much closer to Frank again, I'd give calling him another try, just in case we could mount him from the front of the train and avoid the murder we were being forced into committing. And although he proved his unmatched loyalty once again, even going as far as to ride alongside the train now, the prompt to jump onto him from the carriage never showed, and eventually we were separated once again by a tunnel, frustrated, disheartened, and reluctant to move forward, forced into killing for the first time to progress. Something I didn't expect for us to face so soon, and something I didn't want Western Jesus to have to encounter at all. But considering that the objective was on the other side of a scripted sequence, and having tried everything that I had so far as well, it seemed as though there was absolutely no way to bypass this. And so I walked over to Lenny, picked up the restrained enemy I'd placed in front of him earlier, and decided to move him further away. I can't remember my reasoning for this exactly, but I honestly think I was just moving him out of boredom while preparing to carry out the very first kill of this playthrough. But when I dropped the guard onto the ground, something different happened. I accidentally knocked him out. And while my impulse reaction was to be annoyed considering my plan was to completely bypass this knockout by leaving him tied up, his unconsciousness initiated something that I hadn't seen yet. After Lenny's reluctance to move forward this entire time, he ran straight past me and towards the train controls, copping a shovel to the forehead in the process. And just like that, every ounce of hope I'd just lost came flooding back in an instant. This was our ticket to avoiding the animation. This was our solution to avoiding the forced kill. And after hours upon hours of torturous attempts, 
one measly knockout had given Lenny the incentive to take charge. And now, it was time to work out exactly how we were going to save him without murdering the conductor. I pulled out my trusty lasso and aimed at them. The game was giving the option for me to throw it, but my rapid tapping of R2 was doing nothing. Eventually, I was able to free throw it, but it did little more than glitch Lenny and the conductor for a split second. And not long after, Lenny was thrown to his death the same way I had been before. So we were on a time limit for each of these attempts, but that didn't matter so much considering this checkpoint triggered for Lenny the same way it had for us. I tried getting different angles with the lasso so I could maybe hit the conductor more directly, but nothing seemed to be working. And this started to make me think that maybe we hadn't stumbled across the solution I was hoping for. Lenny was thrown into an early grave again, cementing my worry that we had indeed hit good boy bedrock. We began the next attempt with Lenny giving us some outstanding advice, really groundbreaking stuff. Shoot him, damn it! Using a gun is in direct violation of Golden Guideline number two. Please contact the number on screen if you have any further questions or inquiries regarding the details of these Golden Guidelines. I decided to try getting behind the conductor so I could restrain him from there, but that was also a no-go. I tried lassoing his little conductor head and then his little conductor toes, but both of those were ineffective as well. So right now, things were again at a little bit of a standstill. I felt we'd made more progress than before, but this progress also seemed to create a slew of new problems. I thought about shooting the conductor's toes, but even if that did work, I wouldn't have been satisfied since we still needed to use a gun regardless. So I started thinking and thinking, really racking my brain for an answer. And then a phrase that I never thought I would ever use in my life came to mind. What would Micah do? If Micah was standing here right now with a problem in front of him that was really just at this point slapping him across the face, what would he do? What would be Micah's ultimate solution for this problem. I stood there for a moment before pulling the knife from my pocket, and I charged that conductor with all the secondhand bitch slap PTSD I could muster. I got in front of the conductor, I swung the knife, and he actually let go of Lenny. The teachings of Micah Bell had actually prevailed, and I honestly think I might have been more shocked than what I was when Micah had first snapped. I didn't want to use the knife excessively, of course, so I tried to back off as the conductor beat the shit out of me. Lenny unexpectedly shot and killed him without a second thought, however, meaning that we had actually bypassed a Rockstar Games scripted animation without a kill. Hands down, the most relieved I've been in this entire series so far. And although I really was amazed that attacking him with the knife actually worked, I've got to say, me and my blueberry brain still weren't exactly satisfied. And I know it's going to sound dumb because it really is, but that kick bothered me way too much even though I really was certain that it didn't have anything to do with the conductor's death. And also just the fact that I used the knife in general had me kind of bothered as well, so I went back into the mission replay and did it without the knife and avoided the random kick just in case it bothered anyone else the same way it bothered me. But anyway, with the conductor out of the way thanks to Lenny finally figuring out how his gun works, it was time to stop this train and gather what we came for. But when Lenny pulled the brakes and we came to a complete stop, a swarm of new enemies came sprawling out of nowhere. After the challenges we had just faced, there was now an army of people who had come to defend the train and Leviticus Cornwall's v buck supply. But much like the O'Driscolls in the trees earlier, they stood much less of a chance than what I was expecting. Lenny must have suddenly gained some confidence because he was destroying enemies left and right while I ran around in circles just trying to stay alive. Not a minute later and Lenny and I had already advanced to the top of the hill which overlooked the train. And as I sprinted to the bottom, we were met by Frank and the rest of the boys who had come to clean up the remaining enemies. Dutch, Micah, Bill, Charles, and Javier all opened fire, while Frank stood back and used his telekinetic abilities to cripple the enemies by snapping their C1 and C2 vertebrae. It was absolute chaos, but thankfully, our good boy Arthur didn't have to take a single part in it. I did not expect at all for this area to be so simple. Now the hard part was definitely over, but the job wasn't exactly done. All that stood between us and the V-Bucks we came for was a highly reinforced steel door and the group of Cornwall's associates that stood behind it. Dutch's solution to this obstacle was getting everybody to fire at the doors, probably bursting the eardrums of every single man inside, no doubt causing lifelong hearing related ailments, so I made sure that Arthur didn't take any part in that either. Unfortunately, placing the dynamite on the doors and letting it blow was kind of unavoidable, so 
They probably left the carriage with the hearing ability of a 96 year old woman anyway. We stepped into the carriage, looked around, found an interesting looking lockbox, opened it, and there they were. Everything we had just worked for was finally in our hands. We bring them out to Dutch and he does a quick calculation of the value of our V-Bucks, and although it was definitely better than nothing, apparently it was barely enough to buy a skin and Dutch really had his eye on a couple of nice ones, so it was kind of disappointing. But anyway, we're left with the decision to either kill or let these guys go, and so of course I pulled out my gun and painted the snow bright red with their blood before leaving them to be consumed by the elements. We mount Frank and return to the camp where preparations to vacate to a new area are made the very next day. Apparently, burying Davy's rotting body right next to where everyone slept was not a good idea, and so packing up and leaving seemed to be the only way to escape the smell. The gang rides off in the direction of a small working town named Valentine, with a pocket full of V-Bucks and their luck seemingly on the turn. After everything that happened on that train, all the challenges, all the low points, all the hope that had been lost, we actually managed to escape the robbery with not only the currency we came for, but also with zero kills and only one knockout. A result that I spent most of the time on that train convinced was impossible. The goodest boy in the West had escaped once again without a single kill under his belt. Now, I just wanted to say before the video ends, the support on this series has been beyond amazing. I really can't thank you guys enough for that. And, you know, I know these episodes do take quite a long time to release, so I just wanted to say again how thankful I am for all of your patience in between the videos. It really means a lot. Now, I'm going to be honest, <laughs> the next episode may take quite a while because I'm looking to condense a lot more of the missions and a lot more of the game's content in general into each episode, mainly because, as a lot of you guys have already pointed out, this series is going to take the rest of my life to finish if we keep doing two missions a video. I mean, I love doing two missions a video and really being able to go into detail on exactly how I completed it, but I mean, the next installment of Red Dead is going to be released by the time I finish it, if we do it that way, so yeah. I also want to start working on some other types of videos in the meantime while I, you know, work on the next episode in the background, so I should have videos for you guys a little more consistently than what I do now, hopefully. Final thing I wanted to say, if you got this far into the video, I want to include you guys in the series a little more, since you all seem to be pretty invested in whatever Frank and Arthur are up to, so I was thinking. I want you all to be able to decide what Arthur is going to look like for the rest of the series. And now that we're moving into the next phase of the game, where customization and everything becomes available, I think having one of you decide what Arthur looks like would be pretty cool, so if you want to have a chance at deciding exactly what Arthur's hair, beard, and clothing looks like for the rest of the series, just at me on Twitter with a screenshot of what you think the good boy should look like, and yeah, I'll choose the one that I think best suits him in a follow-up video. The only real guideline to this, I'd say, is that we don't want him to look too menacing, and I think his overall appearance should match the theme of what this series is all about. But really, other than that, you can do whatever you like. Thank you all again so much for your support on everything, and uh, yeah. For the love of God, eat some vegetables while I'm gone. We need you alive and ready for the next episode. Please, broccoli isn't that bad.